how much do you know about ducks? If your answer is not much, then you're definitely not alone. We found that four out of five Victorians couldn't name one species of native duck. That was Mari from RSPCA Victoria, who's been researching all things native ducks so we can get more of the community excited about these fascinating creatures. We really think it's important that people have an awareness that we have native ducks so that they really develop a connection with them and then um, want to protect their welfare. There's certainly some misconceptions out there. For example, many of us might have fond memories of feeding ducks some leftover bread, but that's a big no-no as it can turn ducks aggressive and lead to overpopulation in areas frequented by humans. In this episode of Creature Tales, we've turned to our friends at BirdLife Australia to help enlighten us about the mysterious life of ducks, why they're crucial to wetland ecosystems, and just how much danger these precious birds are actually in. I'm uh, Chris Pernell with BirdLife Australia, and I'm the Wetland Bird Program Manager. It turns out being a wetlands expert is just as fascinating as it sounds. One day we could be up in Arnhem Land monitoring threatened water birds and, and shorebirds, and the next day we could be contributing to advocacy for you know protection of a, a threatened wetland in the Belfast coast. It's, uh, it varies day to day, and what keeps it exciting. Chris, how much do you think Australians actually know about ducks and wetlands? If, if you count the spotted whistling duck, we've got 17 species of duck. People generally, when they, they think of wetlands, they think of probably the permanent lakes and, and wetland systems around urban areas. Um, and they associate them with, you know, your common ducks and, and perhaps a heron or two and maybe a coot. They might not give it second thought, but you don't have to travel far to even in those common wetlands to find some really rare and unique species. In your opinion, Chris, what makes ducks so special? Uh, when you start to look at them a little bit closer, you just realise how uh, wonderful they are and unique from one another. And I think a lot of people have been sleeping on ducks because they think that they're so common and they associate them with, you know, the ducks that we see around our golf courses and, and roundabouts and footy ovals like wood duck and Pacific black ducks and, and teal. Uh, but then once you start looking at those species and, and how they behave and the amazing distances they travel, and then you start noticing the other species, you know, like the arid ducks, we call them the arid inland ducks, like pinky eared duck that um, travel thousands of kilometres a year and uh, turn up on salt lakes uh, around the Lake Air Basin, and the Paru, uh, and their bizarre behaviours. Some of the, some birds like musk duck um, that is still a mystery uh, evolutionarily uh, compared to the other ducks. It's it's only occurs in Australia and uh, has this huge lobed dual lap under its bill. It, it's a bizarre species, and it, you know that's a carnivorous duck. How, how weird is that? A carnivorous duck. Okay, so what does their menu look like? Ah, well, they're, yeah, they're not into kebabs and T-bone steaks, but they're diving ducks. They're amazing swimmers. They're not great flyers. They're one of Australia's biggest ducks. They eat crayfish, they eat uh, snails and other mollusks, all sorts of uh, crustaceans, and they'll even be known to eat frogs and ducklings. So they're quite a unique duck. Well, that is something I never knew. I'd love to hear more about the weird and wacky side of ducks. What are some of their more unique behaviours? Phenomenal breeding displays. And even our most common uh, ducks, like Pacific black ducks, have, have amazing breeding displays, if you've ever seen them. They stand right up on their tails and they'll, they'll dip their bill into the water and then flick an arc of, of water over the head while doing what's called a... Uh, a grunt whistle, which, you know, uh, that already sounds pretty sexy, doesn't it? But uh, uh, it's it's become synonymous with the, the Pacific black duck and, and um, it's, yeah, it's one of the more amazing displays. The blue-billed duck is one of the, it's called a stiff-tailed duck and it fans its tail out onto the water and then kicks vigorously and flack, flicks water up and, and, and um, makes a, a lot of noise and bobs its head. The male gets this fantastic blue bill. One of the other things that we don't realise is uh, a lot of these birds molt after breeding. So the, often the, the male will just go off and molt. So he's done all, put all his hard work in and then he'll completely change his feathers over. And one species which is pretty phenomenal in this in that they molt all their feathers and are, and are practically flightless is the Australian shell duck, which is our biggest duck. And they'll congregate in their thousands together in this big congregation of helpless ducks who basically can't fly. 
That is certainly fascinating. I'm trying to imagine what a bunch of molting, flightless ducks would look like all in their thousands. <laughs> Chris, on a bit of a different note, can you tell me why ducks are so important to their ecosystems? One of the main things that they do, because they are so numerous and they travel so far, is that they're almost little Uber drivers for, for invertebrates and, and plants and, and seeds, which need to be transported across the landscape. So if a, if a wetland has been dry, there might be some dormant um, invertebrates in, in the sediment in there, but if it's been dry for a long time, they might not survive. But what we've found with water birds, in particular waterfowl, is that they'll pick, pick up and ingest uh, seeds and, and uh, crustaceans and, and invertebrates and then drop them into uh, the new and burgeoning inundated wetlands uh, and almost kickstart their productivity. They're great transporters. I think a lot of us probably visualise ducks as the brown wood duck, the ones we sort of see down at the pond or the park. But really, these ducks can look and act totally differently from each other, can't they? Yeah, definitely. We've got these unique species like the freckle duck. People, we still don't know what, what they're even really related to. They're halfway between a swan and a, and a stiff-tailed duck and the, the male gets a red bill they're Australia's rarest duck and probably we're thinking that it, it needs to be listed as a nationally threatened species. And then other species like the blue bill duck and the pink eared duck is just a, a stunning duck. The pink eared duck has a little pink notch behind it where you'd imagine its ear was, sometimes called the zebra duck. It's got beautiful black and white stripes and it's got this weird spatulated bill. So it's almost twice as wide at the tip than it is at the base. It acts as like a big wide straw and it sucks water in, and then it's got these little flaps down the side of the bill, which act like, you know, like a whale's baleen, basically. So they, they suck all the water in the tip, and then they squirt it out the side, but the little flaps on the side of the mouth actually filter out all the water, and so they can keep in all the plankton and, and the beautiful uh, uh, invertebrates. Can you tell me more about why these duck numbers are declining? Every species of duck that we had data for is has undergone long-term decline from pre-colonization through to you know the last century when we did a, have done a lot more irrigation we've altered the the life cycles and the regularity of, of wetland inundation one thing that we're trying to do at bird life is just try to get a handle on what we consider common species because we often get complacent about common species and don't invest too much time in them because they're so numerous but in the meantime they're actually declining the hardhead, the, the shoveler and the, and, and the freckle duck are actually now uh, being listed under Vic Victorian legislation as, as threatened. I think that there's more people looking at the common species and, and starting to worry about them. In the last year, we Australians have become worried about koalas. Who thought that we would have to be worried about koalas? Who thought we'd have to be worried about platypus? But my God, like these are our most iconic animals. Turns out that they're very, very prone to uh, threats. So the same is happening with ducks. We, we need to set some sort of baseline and, and set targets for restoring their habitats and restoring their populations. And so what would that involve? What does that look like? Yeah, well, a lot of governments are actually doing this and providing e-water, environmental water allocations to important historic breeding sites uh, to give them every chance they can to replace themselves in the population, what we call recruitment. So I guess for a population to stay steady, they need to replace themselves. Their replacement needs to be able to replace itself. So it needs to get old enough to, to breed. If we have, you know, five to 10 years without floods in a, in a particular area, those birds will die without replacing themselves uh, effectively. When there is water in the system, uh, we need to make sure that it's retained and it gets to the end point where the breeding occurs rather than being siphoned off for, for agriculture or whatnot. When there isn't, environmental water uh, managers can allocate floods or, or water uh, to particular wetlands to provide the maximum productivity. It's about doing it in a staggered effect and creating a mosaic of different types of wetlands that cater for different types of animals and different types of vegetation. And so are wetlands in decline as well? Yeah, well, we've, uh, we've certainly lost uh, a lot of sites. Uh, so particularly those ephemeral wetlands, which uh, are iconic of us in Australia. Uh, you know, lots, lots of depressions that would episodically fill. It might even only be every five to ten years, but 
if they were dry, um, then often they were infilled and, and turned into agricultural crops. And what's the solution, do you think? The mechanisms to reverse what's been done with hydrological controls uh, that we've in place is a slow one. And, and, you know, in the last few years, we've seen we've seen inquests into the Murray-Darling Basin and how effect, effective the use of water is. And, and there's still a very leaky system, even uh, in, it, in years where we've had big rains. Um, a lot of that water doesn't meet, reach the endpoints where we, where we had predicted it will get to. Given this uncertainty around water availability, how has that shaped the behaviour of native Australian ducks? Most of our species, their ecology sort of reflects that. So they don't migrate. In the US and in Europe, we know birds that have regular pathways. They go north and south or east and west, where our birds are a lot more opportunistic and, and what we call nomadic. And they, they move in relation to water and they breed in relation to water. So they, they might not breed for several years. And then one year they might breed throughout the year, just depending on when and where the water is available. How far will Australian ducks fly for water? Oh, they've been tracked to you know go several thousand kilometres uh, in response to to water appearing in the landscape, and and some species have exploratory flights, and other species seem to just know where the water turns up, and they'll fly directly to to where water sources are. Um, so we're still learning a lot about how how water birds respond to water and how they judge the climatic conditions. They s- seem to be able to find water uh, when it is available. And what happens if ducks lose their water supplies? Yeah, well, they, they just go and have to go and seek other sites, and sometimes that means that they get concentrated in huge uh, uh, flocks in coastal areas. Uh, you know, if you think about some of the premier uh, bird watching sites in in Australia, one of them's a, a sewage treatment plant in Victoria. In drought years, sometimes you know over two hundred thousand uh, waterfowl will turn up at the, at the Western Treatment Plant. So species like shell duck, you might get 34,000 shell duck turn up. You might get it's these huge, huge flocks of birds can congregate in, in very small areas. And then rains come in Queensland and you might not see any, any of those ducks uh, for the rest of the year. We think, oh, it's great down in Melbourne. We get to see all these birds, but... That's because they're becoming concentrated along uh, these permanent water bodies. And, and the more that they're together as well, the more chance there is for disease to spread. What can the general public do to make a difference to wetlands and the overall welfare of ducks? Each state government has their own strategies that they're working on and, and monitoring programs associated with how they distribute water. Try to, I, I guess... If you're, if you're voting, make sure your, your vote is conscious about uh, water regulation and, and, and how water is used. Uh, I think water for the environment is, is becoming more well known a, a, across the Australian community. People across all sectors are, are right into it. It has benefits across all sectors. And, you know, we, we sometimes get a little bit bogged down in, in having water security. You know, we need to have, we've got to have all the water for, for communities and we've got to build bigger dams, but people don't necessarily think about what that's doing to the communities below the dams. Wetland birds in particular are pretty susceptible to disturbance. So uh, if you are around a wetland, uh, you can enjoy it from the banks. Uh, You can even go for a kayak. But birds are particularly susceptible to disturbance from dogs. So uh, if you do have a dog, keep it on a leash, please, uh, because we've done a lot of research into this and, and birds don't trust dogs. And that's because dogs move erratically, particularly ducks. Ducks, you know, they're built for surveillance. They're very edgy, edgy birds, and they are very good at getting away. And any time that they're flying, they're wasting energy. They might abandon a nest. Oh, wow, that's something I hadn't even thought about. That's a great bit of insight for pet owners out there. Well, Chris, we've heard a lot about some alarming numbers when it comes to ducks, but looking to the future now, is there some positivity, some hope there for the future? We're hoping to increase our network of monitoring across uh, Australian wetlands to keep a closer eye on what's happening uh, to these more common species uh, in addition to the threatened species, which we already monitor. By watching the more common species as well, you get an idea about uh, what's happening in those communities and those regional areas. Hopefully, what we can learn from monitoring, we can feed back into the management uh, and that can have great outcomes for not only ducks, but 
uh, all species that rely on wetlands. Do you think the more that people learn about ducks in decline, the more support these species will get? I think so, yeah. I, I think from year to year we have iconic bird species which are thrust into the limelight and, and people really rally behind them and they yeah do feel compelled to do something for our unique wildlife. Once those species are in the zeitgeist and people understand how special they are, they will genuinely do what they can to protect them. So I, I think that there's an overall positive shift and, and the more information we can get out there, uh, the better. That was Chris Purnell from BirdLife Australia. So now the important question you may be asking yourself is, where can I see some of these spectacular species? Here's Mari again. We do have Ramsar wetlands. So they're internationally accredited wetlands. So they've got a lot of environmental significance, which is why they've been accredited. And we have some of those in our backyard. There's even one in metropolitan Melbourne. So the Edith L. Seaford wetlands. So it is quite local. People can head to discoverducks.org.au. So that's where they can find our duck detector map. They can do a quiz and find out which duck they are. So do our which duck are you quiz. And there's a, a load of resources on there, such as fact sheets. So you can learn about the species that you see um, when you're out and about. Mari, you've put a lot of work into promoting the wonderful world of ducks. What would you like to see change in people's perceptions towards them? I'd really love to see people's knowledge increase about our native ducks. So if we go back out and and do a bit of a survey of the Victorian population to see that a few more people can name a native duck, I think that would be a really great step in the right direction. But also to see that people, um, you know, really care about our native ducks and want to work towards protecting them. And I suppose helping to bring back some of those those rare and vulnerable species and and shift the dial on those ducks as well so that we, we have more of them around so more people can see them and you know we know that they're not going to disappear in in generations to come. That was Mari Roberts from RSPCA Victoria. For more information please head to discoverducks.org.au and get exploring in your area. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I hope you found a new appreciation for the delightful ducks that we're so lucky to have here in Australia.